so although it was um, a fictive enterprise in some respects, it was also very real at the heart of it. Very real, and it was also, yeah, it was very real, but it was also a little bit of a game mm -hmm. that made it more fun. Yeah. Just being completely direct right now, I'm telling you. Yeah, we were, it was playful. It was somewhat playful. So that all these grim scenes were not really grim, but they, they, I had some people who performed very well. So I want to ask you now about uh, F.A. Mesmer, who as a figure I, I encounter mainly in the book that you wrote as, a, as somebody who speaks for themselves in the book about the history of the new society, which you carefully distinguish from yourself as the author of the book or editor of the book, your name is on the cover. What is your relationship to this alter ego? Do you, do you perform oh, yeah. as yeah. this alter oh, yeah. ego? Do you only write as yeah. the alter ego? How realized um, are they in your imagination? The alter ego is, the alter ego is the person who is the same as Mesmer, who is a charlatan, it's not essentially a, a charlatan, or somebody who thinks they know everything and knows nothing, or knows very little. And I, I it, it's modeled after, I, I must say, it's modeled after a family member. <laughs> but some, and it's somebody who was very involved with, you know, healing and health and so forth. And I only realized that recently. I said, where did that come from? It's, it's so interesting that I, it, I didn't, it didn't occur to me in, in the least before that. So not quite a charlatan, but someone who has such an inflated self, sense of self-belief that they feel that they can somehow communicate that, those strong beliefs to another person who will then be cured, you know? So that, that's, that's, uh, that's, the real, that's, that's the real impulse. You see, it's, didn't all, it didn't all come from books or reading. It really came from a, a, a personal experience. So that's where the, the trickster impulse that lies behind a game or a, a sort of a semi facade like this, that's where it, one of the places it realizes itself is in this character of F.A. Mesmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody who is, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Do you give lectures as F.A. Mesmer or otherwise perform as them in public? Yeah, you asked me that and I, and, and, uh, yeah, I, I have tried, but it's never been successful <laughs> because because it has to be, oh, that's not true. That's not true. I gave a, I gave a talk at, I think it was Artist Space early on in this project. And I think there may be some people in the audience who were even there. And I had a standing ovation for like 15 minutes. So, but it, it depends on where, if you're in a sophisticated place like New York and they get it, they get the gag and they get the, the humor and they get that it's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated construct, but if you go to a if you go to a small town someplace, and you I tried to act as F.A. Mesmer, people are sort of like they just they just get very upset. They think I'm crazy. They thought I was crazy. So uh, I'm actually always interested in what kind of pushback fictive artists get on these projects. Are you saying you've got actually encountered some pushback on this well, project? I don't think the audience was happy. Why weren't they happy? Because they because it was too extreme. The, 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 the invention that I was, the absurdity of the invention that I was presenting to them, well, it was absurd. And yet I was presenting it as medical and healing and so forth like that. And that combination of medicine and absurdity is a very difficult one to take, you know? And so I think people were, and then people thought I was crazy. They thought I was, <laughs> You know, so. Were you making <laughs> absurd claims? Were you offering to do specific treatments on people and frightening them? Can you well, similar to Mesmer, similar to what Mesmer would have done? But know? he had he had consent, so it sounds like you were talking to people, but you weren't actually roping them in yet because they were resisting. I would or... describe I would describe the new society in Athol Springs, New York. I would describe what we did there. I would describe you know, all of the activities. And then I would show animals and, you know, and, and talk about magnetism. And so for any, an uninitiated audience who's not in the art world or the literary world, it was a hard, it was hard for them to, who just came in raw, you know, to this thing. If maybe if they had known in advance, but I didn't want to do that. The last thing I wanted to do was let them know in advance. 
because I did want to push them, but you know, it doesn't always work. <laughs> So. No, it doesn't. And that, that's one of the problems is when, when, do, when, if ever, do you out the project? What kind of clues do you give people? And do those clues always work? And, that, you know, obviously they don't always work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't um, know how I, I could have done that differently. I don't know how. So the project, I have, an, I have another question that goes back to the way you work with history. Mm -hmm. There's the roots, the historical roots of this project are very clear, particularly if you happen to have read the book uh, as I have. But there's also something profoundly ahistorical about it in that you are riffing on what Mesmer does. You're not trying to actually be completely true to what they did in the 18th century. You're turning it into this creative enterprise where you get to make all kinds of new events, new games, new uh, moments. Mm -hmm. What can you talk about what an the relationship, necessary relationship in your artwork is between the historical and the not historical? Is the historical necessary as a root, do you think? Is it necessary because you want to bring it to people in this disguised oh, form? Rest. I have never thought about that. Um, the sort of the, 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 uh, the appeal of history is its, I suppose, is its validity, is its fact, is its factuality, right? So that, but I think I also tremendously enjoy finding quirky things in history that remind me of the period that we're living in now, but they're far away and they, they can't cause us any harm right now. So I love reading history, but I haven't really answered your question. Um, I, I don't, you know, I have to think about that a little more, but I think it's just because I love, I love history. And I'd like to bring it to people in whatever form. Yeah. I mean, it was a little bit of a vague question. It's a, it's a very hard thing to describe for many artists what, what role the historical, what role narrative plays in the work because they're often working on, on an instinctual level to make these things work. Sure. Um, sure. Before we open the floor to audience <laughs> questions, I want to um, ask you uh, one final question. It's actually a double question, sorry about that. Uh, one is where might it, the new society go next? Or you, if it's mothballed, I'd like to be interested to know that too. And also what other kinds of things are you working on that you might wanna tell um, our audience about? Well, the first where it would go next, I found, as I said, I found these pictures that have never been shown. And I'm very, very, very eager to show them because they're really, they really capture the period that we live in now. And I was afraid to show them back then. So I'm working very hard on that. And there is a bit of a resistance because uh, they are a bit disturbing. And uh, so I have, to, I have to work even harder. I have to really, really work on, but I'm, I, and then, okay. And then uh, in the past, all the years since, uh, since I did the New Society for Universal Harmony, I've worked on a number of other projects. Uh, let me just, let me see, just to remember. Um, Wait. Okay. Oh, we didn't talk about the, okay, we don't have to, the Oneida colony and all of that. Okay. So let me see here. Um, if you'd like to talk about the way the Oneida colony feeds into this project, I'd be very well, interested to I hear did that. Do, I did do my research. And when I was working on the New Society for Universal Harmony, I visited the Oneida colony and I, and I, and I found it absolutely fascinating, particularly in its history. All, all the, um, there were many utopian societies in upstate New York <coughs> and they were all quasi-religious. They were formed by pastors who had given up the conventional, the, the, the conventional sort of like baggage of being associated with a church or a denomination. And they were probably more, they were more individualistic. They were more maybe narcissistic, whatever. And they would get a group of followers and then they would become the same old, same old, which is that these people were, um, were uh, very uh, despotic. And many of them were sexual predators. And, and the Oneida colony was run by someone named Noise, N-O-Y-E-S who they practiced uh, up, up sexual abstinence, except that he was allowed to initiate all the young women. 
So we're like, there were 29, he had 29 children, you know, and upstate and, and New York or New York City people would go up there and for their, their apple orchards and see them perform and all that. And I think there's a little bit of that in every utopia. And when we, we speak about utopia and even some of the absurdity in the great book Utopia is, you know, should there be gold toilets? I mean, some of this stuff is, um, uh, no one can really, no one can really make that utopia. No one can make that utopia. And so what are we living with? Dystopia, you know, and uh, yeah. they're, 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 it's, it, and it, but it's a tremendous longing for utopia. I just wanna share, this is one of the greatest books I've read. It's three, I think it's three volumes. It's called The Principle of Hope by Ernst Bloch. This is, the, this is volume two. And I'm just gonna read out, read, I mean, I really suggest that if anybody is interested in utopia, they get this book. Arbitrarily, chapter 37, Will and Nature, the Technological Utopias, 38, Buildings which depict a better world, architectural utopias. 39, El Dorado and Eden, the geographic utopias. 40, wishful landscapes portrayed in painting, opera and literature. Because utopia is endemic. To, we all hope for a better world. If we couldn't hope for a better world, we'd be destroyed. That's the, that's the, neat, that's the human essence, the human essence, you know, despite the fact that utopia is so problematic. Uh, wishful landscape and the and wisdom, and uh, let's see another one. And then eight eighth hour day, world and peace, free time and leisure. And he wrote this in um, originally nineteen fifty three in Germany, post war, Frankfurt School. So, and there are many other books that I read like that. So I just find that endlessly utopia endlessly interesting utopia dystopia yes partly because there's always <clears throat> a, a question often an <clears throat> unasked question as to who the utopia is for and this things like the oneida colony show very clearly that the many versions of these utopias only are designed around the needs of one or two or a small number of people for whom whom everyone else is expected to in some way serve or enable so there's a there's a very interest there are very interesting social assumptions under every single utopia, um, which is one of the things that makes them an internally fascinating subject. They become outmoded so quickly too for that reason. Uh, uh, last century's utopias seem um, unbearable in many respects. Uh, yeah. And yet, and and one of the things one of the advantages of creating the kind of uh, one might call it a facade, but might also call it a a temporary utopia, almost like a temporary autonomous zone of the new society is that it only has to be what its participants needed to be for a while. I don't think, as far as I can tell, it, it, there's no sense that you meant it to be one of those eternal creations that seems to be behind many utopian society formations. I hadn't thought about that. It's, it, it's kind of a just enough utopia, a casual utopia. Yeah, and the building is certainly not a substantial edifice. It was, it was, uh, I, I drove around in upstate New York a long time before I found that building, which has a little, uh, has a kind of, the, the cross form is a little bit like a church, but it's funky and low down and, you know, a, a sad, a, a sad invitation to what a real utopia, a real church might be. So it took me a while to find that. And I think it's the perfect building. It's yeah. very oh. convincing. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of convincing, um, I, there's a, 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 a question that appeared early in the chat. I don't know if it was intended for us or it was, a, was a, 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 almost a, a rhetorical remark, but somebody asked whether the statements that were being made, and I'm not sure if it was something I was saying or something you were saying, were fictional or real, because this is one of the things that we run into a lot in this area of practice is that we have become non-credible speakers the minute we open our mouths and talk about this subject. Of course. So is this um, something that you find that you enjoy as, a, as part of a conversational uh, kind of rhetoric that you will know that people are going to question every single thing you say? 
No, I'm actually being very, very straightforward and completely honest. But I'll think about that for the next time. When I, but when I assume the character of Mesmer, you can't believe anything I say, you know, as you know in the book. So you, that's one of the places you've created a boundary that with Mesmer, you can say anything and do anything and trick people. And he, with, as Lenore Mallon, in this conversation, you are sort of bound by truth principles of some kind. I think so, I think so. Interesting, um, interesting distinction. Um, does anyone <laughs> have any questions they want to ask either in the chat or just uh, out loud? Uh, you can certainly feel free to enable your mic uh, to speak a question if you want to. Uh, or you can raise your hand as well if you would rather do that. People are saying they would like to make a pilgrimage. Uh, well, then um, write to me in the chat or you can always re reach me in Athol Springs, New York, you know, where we are situated. Or you can reach me on at 121 West 17th Street in Manhattan, tempor in my temporary home. So, <laughs> no, this is really, it's really interesting. Uh, the longevity of this project makes me very happy that it goes on, that, it, that there's some need that it fulfills, mm -hmm. some interest that it fulfills. Very you were saying- I have a the, question. Yes, please jump in. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Lenore, I'm curious about why you say your the Julie, photographs that, that you, yeah, yeah, it's Julie. Um, I'm sorry, I'm I'm lying down and it's dark, so otherwise I turn on my camera. Um, but why are you saying that the photographs that you haven't shown that you've rediscovered are so disturbing? I I, I don't really find any of them disturbing, and so I'm kind of curious about Have that. You I, you've posted a few, yeah. Oh no, I haven't, uh, I haven't. I've just posted a few, but I haven't. Posted, oh no, you haven't. There are more disturbing there things that more, you haven't yeah, posted. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'd like to see Although, those. Yeah, I'll see. I like I like disturbing, you know. So that really appeals to me, Excellent. and that's of course why I I, I loved this project so much, Thank you. Thank um, you. and still do. Thank you so much. No, I'll send them to you. I have a little blad that Russell Hassel made. So, uh, and it's quite nice. So I'll send it. Okay, good. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Julie. Thank mm -hmm. you. I also want to mention that, and there's another question that I can't, so then I'll stop. But, you know, you have to picture Lenore when she gives these talks as um, Mesmer, that she's wearing a white lab coat. And uh, that that makes it even more convincing, you know, that she's full of shit, you know, <laughs> when she's doing this. I'm going to tell her the story, just the talk you gave to a bunch of engineers and scientists oh, at Stevens my. Institute oh, and how I almost got fired for that. <laughs> that was great. Okay, so I'll be quiet now. The lab coat has been something a number of us have exploited. It's very, it's a very useful prop. Uh, yes, indeed. And it has the logo of the new society on it. And when I was in Poland, my, uh, uh, an, an artist, Anne McCoy, curated a show that I was in on spiritual art. It was in Poland and they, they believed me. I was wearing, the, I, she wore the lab coat I wore and, I, and they wanted me to heal them. And I felt, I, I felt very, very conflicted. I didn't know quite what to do. So it really put me in a bind. So I did my best. I, I laid on hands. I did what I, I wanted to make them happier, feel that they had gotten something from this. So I tried to be a spiritual healer on the spot, you know, that's the very first. Well, you know, the, that happened. The placebo effect works 50% of the time or so. So, you know, I'm sure you helped half of them. True, true, true. You know, Julie brought up something that I also wanted to ask you to elaborate on. You said that originally these photographs were too disturbing to, you were afraid to show them, but not now. What has changed culturally that makes you feel these photographs can come out now? Is it? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I think I was so vulnerable 
when I first began this project, having had so many, so many difficult life experiences that I really couldn't handle them. Because it, and partly they came out of a, they came out of my own grief and anger and who knows what. So I couldn't handle them. Okay. But now they seem no different from anybody else's grief and whatever it is in the world, in the dystopic world we live in right now. So they fit right in. Yes, they have acquired a new meaning, which is interesting. Somebody yeah. asks in the chat uh, actually about how, what, referring to the fact that you mentioned you were happy with the longevity of the society and whether it was your intention at the outset to have a project last so long or did it just sort of happen? It happened. I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't thinking about whether it would or not. But when you have a book out, then it, it has a longer life usually than an art show one would hope, and it does. So that's it part seems of to be um, a quality of fictive art projects too, that they, they can, they have a certain longer lifespan because they, they have this ability to keep reaching out in new directions as people, you add a character to the story and then you have to deal with that. And so did you find that that, that snowball effect was also part of it at all? I suppose you? when I looked at these new pictures, yes, I did. I wouldn't have characterized it that way, but it's an interesting way to look at it. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Any other questions from our audience? No. Here's one. How do you think about people thinking that you're crazy as an artist, but also as a real person in the world? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> well, as a real person in the world, it would be really upsetting to know that people thought I was crazy. As an artist, that's totally fine. So um, that's, my, that's my gut answer to that question. And they did, and when I did perform at an upstate college and they invited the people from the town uh, to my event in the art, in, in, the, in the museum, and they were like totally freaked out, I was quite, I didn't do a good, that meant I didn't do a good job because I needed to make it, I, had, I needed to invite them in, in some way and give them, give them, a, give them a good time and have them have, have some insights. But they, but the full thing, full on, they just couldn't, they didn't understand. Maybe some notes at the beginning saying, it might've been really helpful to have some printed notes saying you're watching a performance, blah, blah, that would have really, really but i had no experience really with this material so i didn't do that it just went right up you know so but that was the only bad time julie you were at julie can you hear me i'm here yeah mm -hmm. were you at I'm the here. conference i gave at apex art by chance by any chance um you know, I think I was, but you know, because I I knew the whole story, you know, because I knew it was fake. Right. Um, you know, I I just laugh. You know, I mean, I I just I was in on it too. You know, sure. I uh, it, the the event at Stevens when you spoke to the engineers and the, and the scientists and they all believed you. Um, uh, and I almost got fired as a result because people said, "Why? How could you bring in such a, a such an idiotic subject? You know, as utopias, you know." <laughs> but it was, you know, it was hysterical. And so, I don't know. Um, I think I was at the Apex R R one too. Probably you were. We have one more question. Um, did you ever find yourself believing yourself at any point? It, as uh, Mesmer or otherwise within this project? And if so, what was that moment? Well, it continues because the people who are associated with it love to call me Dr. Mesmer. And, and there's a warmth between us and there's an association between us. So I would say yes to that question. And on, it goes on, it's ongoing. And somebody, a lovely person today said to me, he said, um, I'm so, Dr. Mesmer, he actually said this, he said, Dr. Mesmer, I'm so sorry to give you this like long-winded story about my grandmother. So he referred back. So that was kind of nice. Yeah. 
So there is an indirect way, perhaps, in which you have acquired status as a healer without actually intending to be a healer. Sure. Which is quite interesting. You've kind of backed into it through this uh, performative mode. Perha uh, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, Anto, if you may, I chime Please. in here. Thank you. Um, this is great fun. Uh, and it's just an observation, really. It reminds me a little of that film, Galaxy Quest, where the um, Star Trek, you know, all the old Star Trek actors. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and the aliens actually think they've seen the old reruns and think it must be true. Oh, and wonderful, it, wonderful, oh, wonderful. It's so great because, of course, the actors and the, and the aliens give them a starship and say, you have to come and save our universe now. And the actors go, we're just actors. We don't know how to do that. They said, yeah. no, but, but we're in trouble. You've got to do it. So they sort of do. Uh -huh. um, you know, I mean, it's you end up becoming what the people need, maybe. Absolutely. That's a great, I didn't know that. And I just jotted it down. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great point, well, Annie. And it's a very they, funny movie. Yeah. They did, I mean, Star Trek, they did it all. They, they just, every possible predicament every absurdity is in that yes. is in that series yeah i'll google it and i'll find it <laughs> i think you'll love it right. well um lenore i think we're running yeah, out of time and i'm really grateful to you for doing this okay. uh and showing us a little bit inside <laughs> this uh, fascinating world you created one second i just should say the film that i made called circe has won a number of prizes. It will be at Anthology Film Archives. I shot it in I shot it in Genoa, and not this summer, but last summer. And um, I've been working on many other projects. I worked on a project called Circe that I shot in. I just said that Circe is going to be yes, yeah, Circe, and other films are coming up soon. And I keep working. I'm just sort of that's what I love. So why not do it all the time? And um, as a final moment, uh, uh, Carrie Patterson just pointed out that this quality of becoming what's needed in the moment reflects the, what's happening in Ukraine with uh, president, the president of Ukraine. So <laughs> it's a strange thing uh, uh, where he's faked himself into becoming president in a wartime state. Unbelievable. Yeah, extraordinary performance. Yeah, 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 exactly. Gordy, over to you. Yes. Well, listen, I would like to thank our guest, Lenore Malin. And of course, Professor Lafarge, this, this series is incredible. So I, I'm very grateful. And many thanks to Carrie Patterson of Double House Press for publishing such a fine book, Sting in the Tail, Art, Hoax, and Provocation. This is Gordy Grundy for artreporttoday.com. <laughs>